Good afternoon, space flight enthusiasts, and welcome to a real quick angry bulletin about the Artemis program. And for once, we've got good news. NASA appears to have been making a lot more progress on the Artemis II mission than they thought. And for once, they've been able to move up the date rather than delay it as they have done over and over again. It's not a massive advancement. We're only talking a two-month improvement. But what that does is it makes it less than a year now before we are going to see a return to the moon. Granted, not a landing on the moon, but still a massive change in the future of human spaceflight because humans have been largely restricted to low Earth orbit and nowhere in between for a very long time. And that is about to change quite radically. But what about Artemis 2? What makes it so important? And and given the fact that Artemis 3 still has lots of really serious hurdles in front of it, is it really that big of a deal for mankind to orbit the moon when landing on it seems so far in the future? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to another Angry Bulletin here on The Angry Astronaut. Real quick, I wanted to thank the latest Patreon supporters who have joined in the last 24 hours, Casey, Curtis Van Campen, and Artal. Thank you so much for your support, and I hope you enjoy all the exclusive content that we've added lately for Patreon supporters. We've got 16 exclusive videos in the library now for folks who want to support the channel. And a quick reminder for those of you who bought merchandise in the most recent merchandise promotion that we had going for the channel and if you're not patreon members at the same time just email me a copy of your receipt and i'll make you a patreon member for the next 30 days as a thank you okay enough self-promotion and in the course of this video i'm going to be quoting extensively from an article from americaspace.com entitled nasa accelerates artemis to Two by two months. Pretty self explanatory, but still very good news. Quote Even for spaceflight enthusiasts, it is difficult to comprehend how monumental next year's Artemis II mission will be. The crude lunar flyby will be the 21st century's equivalent of Apollo 8, which captured the world's imagination with its Earth rise photo and its reading from the book of Genesis. It will almost certainly attract a larger audience than any prior spaceflight venture in this young millennium, and now we know that this event may be less than a year away. In the midst of a high-profile Crew Dragon launch broadcast, a NASA spokesman announced that Artemis II's target launch date had been moved up by two months to February of 2026. NASA officially confirmed this ambition in a follow-up statement to America's space. And by the way, nobody else in the media seems to have the slightest idea that this has happened. America's space seems to have an exclusive scoop on this. Uh, aside from me, that is, because I bothered to actually read their materials. But anyway, let's go ahead and continue. The acceleration of the schedule for the crewed test flight is a much-needed ray of hope for Project Artemis. It represents a reversal of a series of delays, which was necessary, but also drew the unwelcome attention of the program's critics. Last January, Artemis II was delayed from November of 2024 to September of 2025 due to a handful of safety-related issues. Paramount among them was the unexpected loss of large chunks of material from Artemis 1's heat shield. This problem was resolved in early December, but a requirement for additional analyses of the spacecraft's life support system forced another delay to April of 2026. In the aggregate, Artemis 2 has suffered 17 months worth of delays in a 12-month period. This is just my opinion. There's little doubt that this led to a lot of rumors about SLS being canceled and Artemis being abandoned. But again, we'll continue with the article. Artemis 2's greatest travails now seem to be behind it. All of the components of the second space launch system rocket have been delivered to the Kennedy Space Center. Its twin solid rocket boosters were assembled over the course of the past three months, and they now tower 177 feet above ground level. 
Last Friday, the orange core stage, the central element of the rocket, was moved out of its processing cell and into the horizontal cradle. After a brief series of inspections, it will be bolted in place between the two boosters. And incidentally, to give you an update on that, it has been bolted in place between the two boosters at the time of this recording. Unlike its predecessor from Artemis 1, which had to be serviced extensively after being stacked, this core stage is essentially ready to fly now. Even the Orion spacecraft, which was always the pacing item for the Artemis 2 mission, is now in a comfortable position. The spacecraft's four solar array wings were installed last week. The panels, which make Orion vaguely reminiscent of a rebel starfighter from George Lucas's Star Wars films, were the final components of the spacecraft to be installed. Like the core stage, Orion is undergoing final checkouts. As soon as these are complete, NASA will begin to process it for launch. 900 miles away, four courageous explorers are deep into their preparations for a journey around the far side of the moon. Mission Commander Reed Wiseman, Pilot Victor Glover, and Mission Specialist Christina Koch and Jeremy Hansen board Orion mock-ups or simulators almost every day to rehearse portions of their mission profile. Last November, they joined forces with NASA's elite mission control team, led by Flight Director Zeb Schofield during an integrated simulation to further enhance the fidelity of this training. The crew's training is currently focused on how to execute an emergency return from high Earth orbit in the event of a life support system failure during the first day of the mission. Wiseman's personable and authentic weekly video updates provide a rare glimpse into his crew's work. In addition to their training in Houston, the quartet regularly flies to locations around the country, ranging from KSC to Lockheed's Orion facility in Denver to the headquarters of spacesuit manufacturer David Clark in Worcester, Massachusetts. These site visits enhance the training curriculum. Perhaps more importantly, they allow the thousands of Americans who are building SLS and Orion to know more about the unique individuals whose lives are ultimately in their hands. All of this progress has increased NASA's confidence in its schedule for Artemis II. When you're dealing with complex, crude spacecraft, serious technical issues will often reveal themselves during system testing, as Orion's life support system and battery anomalies did. The appearance of a last-minute issue, such as the hydrogen leaks which plagued Artemis 1 is always possible, but its probability decreases as the spacecraft progresses further through testing. This allowed NASA to get ambitious with its target launch date for the first crewed flight of the Artemis campaign. When the delay to April of 2026 was announced, NASA's leaders emphasized that the launch could potentially take place at an earlier date. Since then, the mission management team, which is responsible for for planning Artemis II and managing risks to its schedule, and the safety of the crew has worked diligently to compress this schedule. Over the past month, their efforts have focused on defining a work to launch date, which describes when the mission could launch if no additional issues emerge. Last week, mission manager Matt Ramsey told NASA Space Flight's Philip Sloss that it is before April of 2026, and we're working to pull that back even further to the left. That analysis is evidently complete as NASA elected to reveal the new target date on Wednesday. During a segment about Artemis, which aired during the broadcast of the first launch attempt for the SpaceX Crew-10 mission, agency spokesman Daryl Nail announced that the schedule for Artemis 2 had been accelerated by two months. Speaking to his co-host, NASA astronaut Jessica Mayer, he remarked, there you are, helping out the Artemis 2 crew as they got ready for a dress rehearsal for the mission, which is planned in February of next year. In response to an inquiry from America Space, NASA's Public Affairs Office confirmed that the agency is attempting to move the launch date for Artemis 2 forward. They clarified that the launch could take place as early as February of 2026, although this is not set in stone. And it never is. A February target allows the agency to capitalize on efficiencies in the flow of operations to integrate Integrate the SLS rocket, Orion spacecraft, and supporting ground systems while maintaining crew safety as a top 
priority when this new detail is cross-referenced with Sloss and Ramsey's detailed conversation the path forward for Artemis 2 begins to come into focus over the coming months Orion will be fueled and encapsulated inside its rounded launch abort system while the remaining elements of SLS are stacked on top of the mobile launcher. Orion will be placed atop the rocket in the October time frame. After NASA verifies that all of the vehicle's components are communicating properly with each other, it will make the four-mile trip to Launch Complex 39B atop one of KSE's iconic crawler transports. According to Ramsey, quote, we were challenged to roll out out by the end of the calendar year, that is 2025, and I think we're pretty close to that. At the launch pad, NASA will conduct two dress rehearsals prior to launch date. First, Wiseman, Glover, Coke, and Hansen will practice suiting up, driving out to the launch pad, and boarding the rocket. Then the launch control team will load SLS with cryogenic propellant while nobody is present within the blast radius. Instead of transporting the rocket all the way back to the VAB, NASA will use a new temporary platform to install the batteries which power the explosive flight termination system, which will destroy the rocket if it veers off course. The sequence of steps is nearly identical to the procedures which were utilized during the space shuttle era. Typically, the shuttle will spend one to two months on the launch pad before liftoff. Assuming that Artemis II rolls out at the end of 2025, this precedent aligns with a potential launch attempt next February. The improved schedule forecast likely rules out major changes to Artemis II's mission profile. During the December briefing, uh, NASA's Amit Kastria mentioned that the agency was exploring a rendezvous demonstration involving Orion and a prototype of SpaceX's Starship Lunar Lander. As Artemis II will operate exclusively in a high Earth orbit and in cis-lunar space, this test would presumably require multiple Starship propellant tanker launches. However, given that the last two Starship launches have both failed around the same point during their ascent to orbit, it is unlikely that this rendezvous will be taking place during the Artemis II mission. After launch, the Orion and the upper stage, called the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS, manufactured by United Launch Alliance, will orbit Earth twice to ensure that Orion systems are working as expected while still close to home. After the burn to reach high Earth orbit, Orion will separate from the ICPS. The expended stage will have one final use before it is disposed of through Earth's atmosphere. The crew will use it as a target for a proximity operation operations demonstration. During the demonstration, mission controllers at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston will monitor Orion as the astronauts transition the spacecraft to manual mode and pilot Orion's flight path and orientation. The crew will use Orion's onboard cameras and the view from the spacecraft's windows to line up with ICPS as they approach and back away from the stage to assess Orion's handling qualities and related hardware and software. The demonstration will provide performance data and operational experience that cannot be readily gained on the ground in preparation for critical rendezvous, proximity operations and docking, as well as undocking operations in lunar orbit beginning on Artemis 3. After completing all checkout procedures, Orion will perform a translunar injection burn or TLI. With the ICPS having done most of the work to put Orion into a high Earth orbit, the service module will provide the last push needed to put Orion on a path towards the moon. The service module, by the way, is built by the European Space Agency and the Airbus Corporation. The TLI burn will send the crew on an outbound trip of about four days and around the backside of the moon where they will ultimately create a figure eight orbit extending over 230,000 miles from Earth before Orion returns home. And on the remainder of the trip, the astronauts will continue to evaluate the spacecraft systems, including demonstrating Earth departure and return operations, practicing emergency procedures, and also testing the radiation shelter, among other activities. The Artemis II crew will travel approximately 4,600 miles beyond the far side of the moon, which is far further than any astronaut has traveled in the past. From this vantage point, they will be able to see the Earth and the moon from Orion's windows with the moon close in the foreground and the Earth nearly a quarter 
quarter million miles in the background. With a return trip of about four days, the mission is expected to last about 10 days. Instead of requiring propulsion on the return, the fuel-efficient trajectory harnesses the Earth-Moon gravity field, ensuring that after its trip around the far side of the moon, Orion will be pulled back naturally by Earth's gravity for the free return portion of the mission. Assuming everything goes well, once re-entry is completed 10 days later and once splashdown occurs, these four crew members will have accomplished something that no astronaut has done in over 50 years. And also, there will be one astronaut of color, one female astronaut, and one Canadian astronaut. Do they count as minorities? I don't know. Anyway, those three astronauts will make history in their own unique way. But the question still remains. Once Artemis 2 is complete, what about Artemis 3? Lunar Starship is absolutely vital to the completion of that mission, and admittedly, that program has not advanced as quickly as NASA was hoping. It's already been delayed a number of times, just like SLS has been delayed, but Lunar Starship is likely to get pushed out a lot further. The 2027 projected landing date for Lunar Starship with astronauts in tow on the moon is absurdly optimistic. It's it seems highly unlikely that Lunar Starship will be able to land on the moon by 2028 either. Probably not even 2029, given how things are going right now. Starship has many, many hurdles to cross before it's going to be anywhere close to putting human beings on the surface of the moon without a landing pad at their disposal. To say nothing of other challenges like low Earth orbit refueling, rapid re usability. There are quite a number of hurdles that Starship needs to jump, the first of which the low Earth orbit refueling process probably won't even be tested until 2026. I can't imagine that Starship is going to be mature enough to carry humans down to the surface of the moon anytime before 2030, which is a grim reality to face. But there is something else that NASA can do in the the interim. Instead of trying to land on the moon with Artemis 3, given the fact that the Artemis program is all about establishing a permanent human presence in cislunar space, not just on the lunar surface, the next logical step would be to get the lunar gateway to an operational status and to have the astronauts test out the systems on the gateway, spend some time on the lunar space station, get the space station assembled for that matter, turn the Artemis 3 mission into a lunar space station mission, which will establish humans in lunar presence for actually a longer period of time than the Artemis 3 mission would have. Artemis 3 was designed to land on the lunar surface for a week at most, perhaps even less time, whereas a lunar gateway mission could stay on the station for as long as a month or perhaps even two months, depending depending on how often the station can be resupplied. Establishing a long-term presence in cislunar space, giving Starship more time to reach maturity. That's my opinion anyway. What do you think? Make sure to include your comments and also check the description for various ways to support this content so I can keep bringing it to you. And until next time, stay angry about space.